Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Red Gaming Tech Duckham video, we're going to be discussing as well as analysing tech news, which as usual has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. Hopefully, you're having an amazing day. We've got a ton of stuff to get through in today's video. I want to begin though with Sys Software, as they have released two early reviews of both the Ryzen 7 5800X and the Ryzen 5 5600X. The latter being, of course, a six core part, but according to the executive summary of Sys Software, they are stating that the Zen 3 powered processor is between 15 and 40% faster than Zen 2, which, let's just be honest, is absolutely ridiculous for an uplift from generation to generation. So there's an awful lot to discuss here, so before we do though, a quick word from our sponsor. Before we get into the video itself, I'd like to say that this video is sponsored by Boost Gaming. They provide the world's most secure way of purchasing a gaming credit online. They work with brands such as Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo, Google, Blizzard directly. And, of course, your purchases are 100% secure with instant delivery. And you can be certain of the very best prices possible. You can head over to BoostGaming.com via the affiliate link in the description to pick up your purchase. Thanks very much. You can see the various um, scores yourself as we're going through this review. But according to what this software have uh, provided us here, the 5600X is actually even well, it's dethroned the 9900K, which obviously for a long time was considered the gaming king. And the 8-core 16-thread Ryzen 7 5800X absolutely destroys the previous generation processors from AMD. And I think it's fair to say that against Comet Lake and older Intel processors, well, there is no real fight here. Basically, AMD are just sweeping the board. The executive conclusions for the Ryzen 5 5600X are as follows. The Zen 3 6-core is a 15 to 40% faster than Zen 2 across all kinds of algorithms. We'll give it 9 slash out of 10. This is despite no major architectural changes except for the larger 8-core CCX layout and thus unified level 3 cache over Zen 2. Zen 3 manages to be quite a bit faster across a legacy and heavily vectorized SIMD algorithms. Though in the case of the 6-core, Due to its almost identical turbo compared to the 3600XT, it cannot beat it so soundly as the other siblings we've seen in other reviews. The Zen 2 XT's performance is just too good. As for the 5800X, well, yeah, 25-40% to 40 faster across all kinds of algorithms, and they are giving this thing a 10 out of 10. Intel, though, and this is out of quote, might have a bit of a chance with uh, some performance results of Rocket Lake, and we'll get into Rocket Lake in just a moment, because first of all, we have yet more performance results of the 6900XT, the RX 6800XT, and finally the 6800, which of course are the RDNA 2 based GPUs. AMD have provided a small insight into the performance of these cards. If you missed my video yesterday, I did detail the ray tracing performance of the GPUs and it seems to be about on par, that is the 6800 XT, with the RTX 3070. Now you have to bear in mind that this is with significantly fewer ray tracing cores that Ampere is competing, not only against the RTX 2080 Ti, but also the 6800 XT. Although, I will grant you that it was a synthetic benchmark. However, in terms of traditional rasterization work, there's not much to say about these cards other than they are very fast indeed, like super duper quick. And AMD have also provided further benchmarks to um, the AMD Smart Access Memory Technology. It seems to be around 5% on average, with some games uh, 
seemingly being the exception to the rule, namely Forza Horizon, which is 11% uplift. Smart access memory does require an all AMD build. So you would need an X570 motherboard, for example. You would need a Ryzen CPU, a 5000 series CPU, fast memory, and of course, the most important thing, you would need an AMD GPU. And all of those things come together to increase the performance of the GPUs, which I do wonder how that much that will actually impact people going all AMD. I tend to find AMD fans do buy all AMD, um, just because um, maybe I'm uh, grossly overcharacterizing there, maybe I'm uh, wrong, maybe I'm off the mark, but uh, I do notice a lot of folks do go all AMD builds. Uh, obviously, with NVIDIA, that is impossible because NVIDIA don't provide CPUs, and Intel... Currently, they don't have discrete GPUs. Well, I guess you could game on the iGPU, but uh, it's not exactly ideal for something that's really stressful, like Borderlands or something like that. Anyway, getting onto the performance results itself, this is available on various drop downs on AMD's official website. Uh, we won't go through all of these results because, uh, well, I'll be here until tomorrow. But there are, to me anyway, a few rather interesting standouts. So let's start with Doom Eternal, which is definitely one of the more popular benchmarks from NVIDIA. They have resolutions of both 4K and 1440p, and uh, obviously they are only testing with the Vulkan API, and as well, yeah. Here you can see the performance results um, with, and you, unfortunately you do need to mouse over them, for uh, the exact number to pop up, which is kind of annoying, just ever so slightly annoying. And in these particular results, the RTX 3080 is basically a frame or two ahead of the 6800 XT, and the exact same thing could be said of the 3090. The RTX 3070 would be about on par with the RTX 2080 Ti, um, but you can see that the 6800 is considerably faster, but then again, the 6800 is also more expensive, but until NVIDIA do launch the RTX uh, 3070 Ti, well, that's all we've got. At 1440p, the situation does a slight switcheroo. Again, though, it's just a couple of frames a second, so you can basically say they are on par with Doom Eternal, AMD, however, with uh, Battlefield 5, enjoy a nice performance uplift. So you're looking at 120 for the 6900 um, versus 110 for the 3090. The, 60, the 6800 scores 113 versus 110. So, you know, that's, that's pretty significant. That's pretty decent. Um, and honestly, this continues throughout various benchmarks, with AMD and NVIDIA being very close to one another. I mean, I'm just kind of mousing through right now, and the Resident Evil 3, for example, is 120 versus 117 of the 3080 and the 6800, respectively. To me, I think it's fairly clear that we're going to actually have a really good set of options for gamers going into the next generation of PC hardware. It's going to be all down to availability. Some people are swearing to me that the yields for AMD have been phenomenal. Others are telling me that it's not like that and there's going to be shortages um, for AMD hardware. And honestly, given just the hunger at the moment for hardware upgrades and the amount of available market that there will be going into the Christmas period, which obviously is traditionally a time when people want to upgrade anyway. It's going to be fascinating to see what shortages there are. I am probably going to try and pick up a 6800 XT. Um, maybe I'll be able to get sampled from an AIB, but uh, as for the CPU, that I think will be very interesting. I know a lot of people are upgrading or considering upgrading from like a like a 2700X or something like that. And uh, it's going to be a very curious time to see whether AMD can actually fulfill these orders. Especially given, again, the level of hunger there are for upgrades right now. 
But there is actually some positive news for Intel, which it kind of feels weird for me to say that Intel have got positive news, but you may recall yesterday, which is seemingly so long ago at this point, um, there were a set of uh, reveals from Intel, and one of those reveals was Intel's Rocket Lake. They didn't provide full specifications for it, but they did state that it's going to have a double-digit IPC uplift, which honestly doesn't mean a super amount. I mean, double-digit could be literally like 10% or 99%. And we also don't have, uh, you know, all of the information, but we do know that it's PCIe 4 and blah, 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 as well as based upon the same architecture, Ice Lake. Um, so it's at least more than what we did know. But I'm fairly sure that this is what I'm about to go through is not an accidental leak. I honestly feel that this has been an accidental on purpose leak. But we actually have benchmark results of the uh, 8 core 16 thread processor it doesn't have a name so it's i'm going to assume it's the 11900k but it could be you know anything uh, this was tested on an msi z590 board so it's the next generation motherboard so though intel's processors will work on the 400 series boards and this by, by the way i just want to give uh, credit to tim apisak for finding these results but it must be said that the performance numbers here are actually pretty damn impressive. Um, I think it's very telling to actually compare it against the 10900K. Again, credit to Tom Apisak for the, li for the link. And what I'd like to do is poke you to look at the average scores. So if we look at the one score result, the Rocket Lake engineering sample scores 179 points, whereas on average the 10900K is scoring 152 points. If we then look at the 8 core results, the 10900K does have more than 8 cores, but well, this engineering sample Rocket Lake doesn't, so whatever. Um, it scores 150, uh, sorry, 1115 points compared to the 10900K, which is scoring 1,156 points. And the really crazy thing about this is that the engineering sample is running at just 4.2 gigahertz, which is honestly a very low clock frequency indeed. And in fact, the base frequency is just 3.4 gigahertz. And from what we understand, these CPUs will hit over 5 gigahertz. Intel seems to be basically confirming this, and we're actually hearing some rumors that they could go past 5.1, 5.2, maybe even hitting 5.3 gigahertz. I'll wait until the samples are formally out before I, you know, start singing their praises of that clock frequency. But even if we say pessimistically that it only reaches 5 gigahertz, yeah, these CPUs will definitely spank what intel currently have to offer the question for me is is it going to be enough i mean intel blatantly will be touting the advantages such as uh, speeding up like um avx512 instructions they're going to be touting things such as gaming results the improved igpu and all of the other stuff that i covered yesterday but if you're a pc gamer or you're a content creator, the question is how much does an Intel CPU versus an AMD CPU benefit you? And that's gonna be the $64,000 question. Um, I suspect some applications will work better on Rocket Link. I could be totally wrong there, and I suspect certain games will perform better. But let's assume that it's, you know, five, 10 frames a second at best. Is that going to be enough to convince someone to, you know, cough up and purchase a Rocket Lake processor. I'm going to guess that Intel will definitely be cheaper than, let's say, the 5950X. They may even be cheaper than the 5900X, although that could be kind of wishful thinking on my part. If they are more in line between the price of the 5800 and the 5900, and they are 
tangibly faster in games, tangibly faster, not one or two frames a second, tangibly faster in games, maybe, just maybe, it will be a compelling reason to go with the Intel uh, option. Another reason, of course, is you could already have like a Z490 motherboard. You could have bought like a 10700K, in which case it's a relatively easy upgrade. And the same, of course, could be said for AMD. If you're rocking a 3700X or like a B550 motherboard, realistically, the better option would just be to drop in a Ryzen 5000 series CPU. But anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. The normal stuff, if you have, like, share, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.